Hello, everybody. My name is Aldo Kulki Condor. I'm a software engineer at Google, one of the uh, founding developers of Q. And I'm Rajat. I'm one of the engineering managers at Apple. So today, we wanted to uh, first introduce yourselves to, to Q. Uh, Q is a job level scheduler. Um, it is, it is uh, we call it Kubernetes native because it interacts with the existing uh, Kubernetes ecosystem. So, Cube Scheduler and Cluster Autoscaler, to, uh, uh, it, uh, makes, uh, it adds to them to provide a full batch system uh, or AI training system uh, on a Kubernetes cluster. So, Q takes the decisions of whether a workload or a job should run or should wait for resources. Uh, based on a number of uh, rules. For example, uh, per tenant quotas, how much uh, each user of the cluster is allowed to, to run. Uh, but also, if the cluster is underutilized, there are some rules for borrowing. Uh, and ability, there is the ability to control whether, uh, how much you can borrow from other users in the cluster. Uh, new in, in, in the, the version 0 0.7, we added uh, fair sharing. Uh, in this uh, in this system, and in 0 0.9 we uh, added uh, hierarchy so that you can represent your complex organization uh, uh, in the in the queue system. Um, Q uh, integrates with uh, a number of uh, APIs from the ecosystem, such as well, basically starting from pods from jobs, which are Kubernetes objects, but also from other <coughs> projects and subprojects of Kubernetes, like Jobset, or external projects like Kubeflow or Kubray. Uh, but if you, in your organization, you have your own uh, APIs, you can also use uh, Q's uh, libraries to extend, uh, to integrate with this. Um, so let me explain wh what problem are we trying to solve. Uh, so in the beginning, Bob here has a cluster. Uh, with GPUs, uh, he's very happy because he has jobs to run and they all run, right? Perfect. Um, but even like in the cloud, he, uh, he might be able to auto scale as, as he needs more resources. Uh, the cluster auto scaler brings more nodes and then they, they run. But that's not, but that's not a reality, as we all know. Uh, clusters are not infinite, uh, so Bob here might have extra tasks. So and now we need to. Q them, so that's when Q comes in, Q with a K, and we uh, we are able to represent uh, the 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 quota for for this unique user Bob uh, using a cluster Q definition as shown in, in the picture. Uh, well, here basically you can set up different uh, numbers for the capacity of each of the resources of the cluster, um, but also clusters are often shared. Uh, so here we have. Uh, Bob, Alice, and Chelsea, they all share in the cluster. Um, and this can also be represented in queue uh, thanks to the uh, two fields, uh, or uh, first a field called cohort, which basically tells that these uh, cluster queues are part of a group, and this group allows uh, sharing and borrowing uh, mechanics. And uh, because you're borrowing, you might want to uh, recover uh, whatever you've uh, lent to other users. Um, so there are preemption policies, and more recently, fair sharing. And similarly, you would, you would configure the same for the other users of the cluster. Um, so uh, I've been talking about fair sharing, but let's, let's uh, explain a little bit how it works, uh, how we implemented it in queue. Um, so we have this, this setup again. Uh, we have Bob, Alice, and Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea is on vacation right now, going rock climbing. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the, each, each of the users uh, have an assigned quota. So in this cluster, there are 24 GPUs, and each of them has assigned eight. Uh, but uh, because Chelsea is on vacation, uh, other users can borrow resources. So in this case, uh, Bob has, is borrowing three resources, or three GPUs, uh, Alice is borrowing two, and Chelsea is out. Uh, now, Let's, let's see what happens with Bob and Alice uh, send two uh, uh, jobs each. So which one should run? Uh, so for that, in Q, we define the concept of a share value, uh, which is kind of inspired on uh, dominant resource fairness. Uh, but uh, so we def 
define it as uh, the, the quota, the borrowing quota, so the, the, the color boxes on the left, and uh, divided by the total amount of quota multiplied by a weight, uh, which is, can be defined for each user. Um, so with that, we apply the rule that we can schedule the, cluster, the, the jobs from the cluster queue that has the lowest share value. So uh, if we calculate the share values for all these users, we have uh, three for Bob, three over 24, and two over 24 for Alice. So which one is uh, lowest is Alice, so Alice gets to run her uh, jobs first, so her, her job first. So that, that's uh, the simplest scenario. Now, let's assume now that the cluster is full. Uh, so uh, right now, uh, Bob is borrowing six, uh, Ali, Alice is borrowing two, uh, and now Chelsea comes back from vacation and then she has her job to run. So now she needs to reclaim her space, uh, reclaim her quota. But who should uh, be preempted? So again, we use the same uh, shared value definition uh, and we apply kind of like the opposite rule. We will preempt the cluster queue that has the uh, highest shared value first. So in this case, these are the values and the highest value uh, is Bob. So Bob will have a job targeted for preemption. It will go away and now Alice can run her job. So that these simple rules uh, uh, can be used to implement fair sharing in a cluster with preemptions and, and, and so on. Um, another feature I wanted to highlight that we introduced recently is hierarchical cohorts. Um, so in reality, we don't have just three researchers in an organization. We have uh, teams, and teams can belong to uh, departments, and the departments well, are part of our company. Now, uh, and these, all these teams have different uh, demands of, of jobs. Um, so this can all be represented. Uh, we already saw the definition for the cluster queues, which are the, the, the nodes at the, lo uh, the low level. Uh, but we, uh, we can also define uh, the cohorts uh, that group these this cluster queues together. And we can define basically the same uh, uh, policies for quotas, additional quotas, and fair sharing. Um, and well, this feature of first sharing in the hierarchy is coming soon. It's not there yet, uh, but it's coming in the next few versions. Um, so again, when we have this complex uh, hierarchy, now we ask our, ourselves the same question. Now, how do we uh, implement first sharing? Uh, which, gets, uh, which job gets to run first? Which job should we preempt? So let's imagine that right now these are the share values of each of the, the nodes uh, of the tree. Uh, here we use uh, orange to represent the ones that are borrowing, currently borrowing resources, and the blue ones are not bor borrowing. So now let's assume data wizards and, uh, and data um, backpropagators are sending a job each. Which one should run? So um, here we can start thinking uh, in, a, in, a tree, in a tree algorithm. So we'll start the root, and we will ask ourselves which one has the uh, lowest value, the lowest share value. So that's AI innovators. And then within that subtree, who's uh, next, who's uh, the lowest value? Uh, uh, Backpropagators of the, of the ones that are needing resources right now. Uh, so that job will be able to run. So all good. Uh, if there is space, that, that's the job that will run. But if there is no space currently in the cluster, then we need to preempt. And who should we preempt? Uh, we go back to the root again. Uh, we ask which one of the mm, uh, nodes is using the highest, uh, is borrowing more resources. So that's the, the, the subtree on the right, and the same thing for uh, this subtree. And then uh, that's the job that will get preempted to be able to run the, the backpropagator job. So these two rules, uh, uh, as much as they look simple, they allow this. Um, this uh, policy to be implemented, which is unused resources from within an organization can be used within the organization first. And let me explain a little bit. So uh, if, we, uh, if we consider data wizards and back, back propagators, they are both uh, borrowing resources. But uh, even data wizards has a, a high value of, uh, of resources being borrowed. Uh, 
but uh, we don't preempt that data wizards because if we see AI innovators, the, this, the department is still uh, not borrowing resources. So why would you, why should we preempt from this sub, uh, sub tree if there is uh, somebody, uh, somebody borrowing from that sub tree on the other side? So uh, that allows us to implement this policy that uh, an organization uses their resources first. Um, next, uh, I want to give it to Rajat to explain how to use these tools to build an ML platform. Thanks, Olo. Uh, so, right, so let's take a look on how Q can be leveraged to build or assist in doing ML platforms. Let's say if you have an ML platform which is catering to some use cases for training or inferencing, in that case, and if you're building on top of Kubernetes, what you generally end up doing is abstracting the users from all the Kubernetes inferences, or Kubernetes interfaces if you want to. But at the same time, you do some heavy lifting about quota management in the ML platforms, meaning you talk about how are the teams being organized, how are the orgs being organized, how much quotas each org and tenant is getting there, who gets to admit and who doesn't get to admit. So those are the things which you need to worry about. Uh, now with Q coming in the path, you can simplify some of that logic. And what it means is the quota management for the orgs, teams, and whoever is using these ML platforms within the organization or a company, they can be pushed more downstream at Q level with some nominal quota and borrow limits uh, on what Aldo was explaining just now. And, and basically, it's simplifying the quota management and also simplifying some of the second level scheduling which ML platforms might have to do. Now, let's look at some of the features uh, which we covered but going probably in more of the use cases, why, why Q comes more relevant for these kind of ML platforms. Let's say in this example, there's a cluster, and on the cluster, we have four tenants. Each of the tenant have their guarantees, or let's in Q language call it nominal quotas being set up. And, and let's say each of the tenants gets 25% of guarantees in the cluster. And their limits, meaning how much they can burst across the cluster, it's said to do it for all the cluster. Now, gang scheduling and gang preemption becomes an important use case with large language models becoming popular over the years. There is even more requirement now to schedule the workloads in a gang-aware fashion for the training workloads. And, and that's where Q comes in, and it acts as an admission controller. If a workload or the collection of parts which need to be gang scheduled comes to a tenant or comes to a cluster queue, the queue looks into the nominal quota. Does it have nominal quotas or guarantees to run? Or, or can it borrow from someone and run it? It only admits if it's all or nothing paradigm, and that helps to get the gang scheduling going on. At the same time, when it comes to preemption, uh, Q makes sure that it preempts the entire workload or all the ranks of a big gang together versus doing some partial preemptions across the gangs. And, and this prevents from excessive preemption and also make the system more optimal. At the same time, as we talked about some concepts about the priority and reclamation preemption, it comes handy because now a tenant who have its own guarantees can utilize that. And at the same time, it can burst and use capacity from other tenants, and, and that's helpful for increasing the utilization of the cluster. At the same time, if, if a tenant is uh, running some not so important workloads, let's call them lower priority workloads, they can prioritize more important use cases, which they have been working on uh, adapting to the production scenarios, and they can come in right away, preempt the lower priority workloads, so they can do prioritization, uh, making system optimal without hand-holding which goes first and which shouldn't be running. So those comes into play as well. And as Olo talked about, the hierarchies of organization teams can be modeled, and even more with Q0.9, which is upcoming. So we'll talk about it in a bit. The other feature, which is quite interesting, and that's for if you're looking for accelerators like GPUs to do some scheduling for RDMA awareness, which generally works if the GPUs are close to each other in proximity, you can divide those proximity into certain flavors in Q. Let's say in this case, 
Zone 1 is one of the place where uh, RDMA can work because of the affinity between or proximity between GPUs and Zone 2 as well. Now, what Q ensures if if a gang comes in, it either schedules in zone one or schedules in zone two. It will never do a cross zone scheduling which will break RDMA. So those are some of the functionalities which can be leveraged for zone aware scheduling or spine aware scheduling, whatever you call it. Uh, now, an interesting thing here is it still prioritizes to use the guarantees before borrowing from others. Let's say if zone one have some guarantees available for tenant one and zone two have some available guarantees, it will first try to attempt to use the guarantees so that it's prevented from reclamation-based preemption, and only if it cannot use the guarantees, it starts using the burst capacity. Now, as we're talking about these quotas and, and nominal quotas, borrow limits, they can be changed dynamically and takes effect immediately, and you can think of making some kind of self-service tool on top of it, which really helps in changing the quotas dynamically uh, as the use cases become more important and, and things like that. Now, other interesting thing to talk about is, suppose you have a case where the tenants, uh, there are some tenants in the system who doesn't have the nominal quotas, but they still want to use the workloads. They still want to submit and use any available capacity in the cluster there can be a case made to introduce a new cluster queue, let's call it burst cluster queue, which can be used for submission for anyone who doesn't have guarantees. And if you see this burst cluster queue have guarantees as zero, but it can still use all the capacity from the cluster. And, and that helps in, again, boosting the utilization and, and having that burst capacity available for everyone to leverage. Now, since we talked about burst capacity and, and sharing, uh, let's talk about a case where a single tenant can potentially take over the entire capacity. Uh, let's say the use case where tenant three and tenant four having their guarantees, but they're still not submitting for, for whatever reasons. This can happen because you know don't expect all the tenants to be active at the same time and using the guarantees. Uh, and in this case, tenant one uh, who have the guarantees of quarter of the cluster and limits to all the cluster can submit a bunch of workloads probably way early in the day and, and win the race and get access to all the burst capacity. So those kind of scenarios might happen. This definitely favors utilization, but, but lacks the fairness because now tenant two who wants to leverage the burst capacity cannot leverage it because tenant one has overtaken all the capacity. How do we solve this? So there are two ways one of the option being that you enforce limits for each of the tenant. Like notice from limits to all, we have changed it to limits to 50%, meaning a tenant one can only use 50% of the cluster. So what it means is that tenant one uses its guarantees and then bursts and uses some of the capacity from tenant three in this case. Uh, but if you notice, if there is no one really active and competing for that burst capacity, uh, you are kind of leaving some utilization off the table in that case, right? You are artificially restricting tenant one to just be capped at certain limit, even though it can take advantage of the entire cluster. So you, it requires a lot of frequent adjustments and, and may impact utilization. And that's where the fair sharing comes into play. In this case, uh, tenant one, Instead of limits, now things have changed to weights, the fair share weights, what Aldo described in the algorithm. So now tenant one has a weight of 25%, or they have e all equal weights, let's say, so they have equal dips on the burst capacity. There is no one active in the system apart from tenant one, and tenant two use, uh, using its own guarantees. Tenant one comes in, can access all the cluster, all good so far. But now, Tenant two says, okay, I need to submit some workloads, and it gets in, and it preempts some of the burst capacity tenant one workloads, and, and that's bringing fairness in the favor of utilization as well. Now, if you look at here so far, we have been talking at flat level, where these tenants can be part of different orgs, different teams, and they're competing for that burst capacity in certain format, right? Or, or their own capacity being kind of shared between different uh, things. And that's where the newer features which are upcoming, the hierarchical cohorts fair sharing comes into play, where you can prioritize a capacity for an org. They have the first dips to their capacity before any other org can leverage it. 
In the same fashion, you can put a burst-only cluster queue at the highest level, which have access to all the orcs, but first one to get preempted, because the fair share weight for that one is zero in this case, or, or lowest fair share weight. So those are some of the hierarchical advances which are coming, and Aldo covered those topics in depth. Uh, with this, I would hand over to Aldo for talking about some of the highlights coming in Q. Yes, uh, so over this year, we have released a number of uh, minor versions, uh, and I wanted to highlight some of the features. Of course, fair sharing is the, the, the highlight of 0 0.7, uh, but also we work a lot on s scalability uh, to uh, enable uh, use cases where, well, of big, big clusters, big organizations, so we worked a lot on this. Uh, for the pod integration in particular. Uh, we also uh, graduated provisioning requests to beta. Provisioning request is an API for Q to communicate um, with Cluster Autoscaler to uh, inform an uh, upcoming scale up uh, in bulk. So we have, been work, um, we have implemented that for a few releases and it graduated to beta 0.7. We also introduced QCTL, which is uh, a CLI uh, targeting cluster administrators, so the uh, administrators don't always have to deal with YAML. Uh, they can uh, use the CLI to uh, set up some quotas or even pause or suspend jobs po or pause entire, entire cluster queues um, and so on. Um, we also, uh, in 0 0.8, we also worked uh, on improving the preemption throughput uh, and uh, introduced also some policies around, around preemption and also uh, better observability uh, of, of uh, specifically the preemptions, uh, how, uh, which, which would cluster queues preempting, how many uh, metrics uh, and statuses and events. Uh, now in 0 0.9, which we released last week, uh, we introduced uh, uh, topology aware scheduling, uh, which is a, a, a quite a complex feature uh, that uh, is now alpha. Um, we also talked about, uh, we also introduced hierarchical cohorts, which uh, uh, we have uh, discussed. And uh, we graduated uh, multi queue to beta. Multi queue is a mode in queue that allows it to run multi cluster. Uh, and uh, we have a keynote to, uh, tomorrow, yes, uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, so, uh, yep, um, pay attention to that one. It's, uh, it's going to be a very cool demo by. Uh, uh, Marcin uh, and Ricardo. Um, also, we, uh, we've been asked uh, a lot that uh, clusters can be shared between serving and um, batch applications or serving and training. So we've wor been working on, on uh, integrating uh, some serving uh, concepts in the queuing uh, so they can be mixed together. Um, so with that, uh, if you have any questions, well, of course, we'll take questions right now. But also, uh, if you uh, uh, have, uh, need to report any issues or just simply want to learn more, you can find us in Slack or uh, the GitHub repo. Uh, and not just me, but a few of the developers are here sitting as well. So if you find me, I can introduce you to uh, other developers of, of, of Q. Uh, and uh, oh, resource transformations. Yes, that's a <laughs> actually a feature that was recently introduced by uh, IBM Research. Uh, sitting right here as well. And so uh, also made it to 0 0.9. Uh, with that, thank you. Uh, and we love your feedback. And now we are open for questions. Um, thank you for this. Uh, reminds me of the Hadoop queues uh, way back in the day when we had uh, queuing there as well with the scheduler. Uh, so just a question around you know, applicability uh, at an organizational standpoint for this, uh, especially with fine-grained cloud autoscaling available already with things like uh, uh, Carpenter and with you also saying that uh, this applies based, uh, to batch you know, uh, inferencing, which is not uh, dependent on time and immediate responses. Uh, so what sort of applicability does this have vis-a-vis -vis the fine-grained autoscaling that is already available? Why would a customer use this vis-a-vis -vis something else, especially in batch mode, right? Real time is different. Number one, 
Number two is when you come to a hypothesis on, on why one should be using this, can you talk to us about some metrics that you have seen why uh, of, of, of how this is better? What sort of metric does it improve in the organization? Does it improve the cost? And if yes, how much of a cost improvement is it going to lead to, hypothetically, for the same workload, uh, which is maybe running in auto scale mode earlier? Thank you. Uh, let me answer the first uh, part of the question. So uh, yes, uh, auto-scaling already is there. Uh, but again, Q is not replacing auto-scaling. Q uses, uh, Q coordinates with cluster auto-scaler. It, it uh, also is compatible with Carpenter. Uh, but uh, they are solving different problems. Uh, auto-scaling is about bringing nodes. It doesn't necessarily know about uh, how many nodes you need for running a particular job. Uh, but Q knows, uh, has way more concepts about fair sharing and like uh, um, user dedicated uh, resources. Uh, so that comes as like the first layer of scheduling. And then it goes back to the cluster to scaler and the scheduler, uh, the, the cube scheduler, to uh, actually do the provisioning uh, and final scheduling. Uh, um, and yeah, uh, we introduced provisioning requests to uh, as a, um, an open API that Carpenter can implement in the future. I don't know if they are already looking at that, but Cluster Autoscaler uh, implements uh, provisioning request. Uh, for the second part of the question? Yeah, so the second part is the benefits in terms of the efficiency or utilization or cost. I think that was the second part. It's hard to really put a number on it uh, at the high level, but let's say if you have enough traffic in the system, and you really want to prioritize some traffic over another based on certain policies, uh, that's really helpful in, in making sure you can do about uh, getting high utilization of the cluster. At the same time, if you look at it, it also depends on the traffic. Apart from that, it also depends on if your workload is really uh, you know, preemption aware, preemption proof. It doesn't lose a bunch of things, especially for ML training use cases, where it's expensive. And if it gets preempted, the preemptions are quite expensive there. If the workload have enough checkpointing restarting capabilities, then it really helps to make sure everything is preemption aware, and you can really bump the utilization in that case. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, we don't have any more time for questions, so maybe you can meet the speakers in the hallway and we can take it over there. Sorry about that. Cool. I think we'll get uh, ready for the next talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.